Welcome to the Million Vegan Grandmothers podcast. And today I have the famous, haha, the beautiful <laughs> Dr. Silesh Rao. Silesh, we're so happy to have you here today. This is such a blessing. Well, thank you for having me, Tammy. You have some really good news to share with us. You were just recently doing a debate at the Oxford Union, and you're going to share that debate with us. And the verdict is that Silesh has won the debate. Tell us a little bit about that experience for you, Silesh. Well, it's not just me. There were four of us on the proposition and four on the opposition. So uh, the president of the Oxford Union is uh, Disha Hegde, and she started the, uh, the case for the proposition. Uh, and then she introduced the members of the opposition. And then the incoming president of the Oxford Union, <laughs> Hannah Edwards, she uh, started the debate for the opposition. She spoke for the opposition. And she, then she introduced the three of us who were speaking for the proposition. So that's how it started. <laughs> Excuse me. And each of us got like 10 minutes to speak. Mm -hmm. And we had broken it up as, you know, I would speak on the environment and then Dr. Chidi uh, and Baga will speak on the uh, on the health matter. And then Joey Carbstrong would speak on ethics. And so that's how we um, we divided that up. And then the other side, uh, it was supposed to be like that, but I don't know what happened. But they were basically all of them focusing on the cultural and uh, um traditional aspects of you know why you should continue to eat meat eat animals uh, very interesting that that's the focus that they chose yeah it was more of an emotional appeal that they were making to the to the members of the oxford union and we were making a factual case you know as to why they should do this and uh, uh, so it's like you think about it it's like 10 minutes per person it's you know an hour and a half for the whole debate and the people were allowed to ask questions from the audience. So they would ask points of information. And, uh, and the interesting thing is, I don't think anyone asked, I mean, no one asked me anything. <laughs> so, and I had lots of facts in mind, you know. Um, but all the others, you know, they were, they were asked questions. So the, the audience was quite engaged. And at the end, they voted for us. Uh, 112 to 84. Yeah. So, so how, that did was you, the, how did you put your team together for the debate? How did that come um, to Yeah, the debate start, well, the talks about the debate started uh, earlier this year, I think sometime around June, when we, um, when the Oxford Union came forward and said that they would be happy to host a debate on this topic. And um, they asked for recommendations. So I uh, recommended the slate. Actually, I recommended Dr. Shirin Kassam and um, uh, Earthling Ed for our side. And Earthling Ed had other engagements, so he couldn't do it. And then Oxford Union found Joey Carbstrong. Mm. And, you know, I, I mean, I was really proud of the the way our side made their case. And they, we really did a good job. Uh, both Dr. Chidi and Joey Carbstrong did an excellent job making the case. And even Disha Hag did an excellent job making the case. Um, and the other side, they they tried, you know, they were appealing on emotional grounds. And so they did their best. And you know, because there, I don't think there is any factual way to argue against this transformation. Okay. I think they've, they've all given up on trying to do that. Right, right. And if we're looking at culture, which we do a lot at Climate Healers and the Grandmothers, mm -hmm. we look at how to infiltrate culture into a more compassionate way of treating humans and the earth and animals. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to move in that direction, we can bring our whole culture with us. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, you know, sticking to tradition is what the main argument was on the other side. And it was, and, and again, you know, telling them uh, they were trying to scare them and uh, saying that you, you will have uh, health issues you know, things like that right if you do this uh, but 
I think people, uh, especially young ch- young students, you know, they're they're not so ill informed that they would fall for things like that. Mm-hmm. Especially if, at Oxford, yeah. And even if students are are not choosing to be vegan at that point, at the point of the debate, mm-hmm. they know it's not true anymore. They know that eating flesh and secretions does not make us healthy. In fact, it does the opposite. Right. Yeah, yeah. We we actually had a broader argument. So we were talking about uh, veganism as not exploiting animals for any purpose, not just for food. Uh, but food was the main focus. Yeah. Um, nevertheless, you know, I uh, I think the uh, the case we were making is that veganism is just saying that we are going to go in that direction, okay, as far as is possible and practicable. And why wouldn't you? When you know it's already hurting the it's hurting the animals, it's hurting our health, it's hurting the uh, hurting the earth. So why wouldn't we do that? It's so you're making it like a, it's a no-brainer. You have to choose our side, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed giving my speech. Yeah. It was uh, so about ten minutes, and uh, a lot of people helped me with writing that speech, with uh, editing it, and making it um, fine-tuning it. So, I mean, I'm grateful to the to our team at Climate Healers. It's beautiful to work in teams, and that's the way that we're going to see everything move towards is from the individual, the overfocus on the individual to the entire species of all beings. And so, working together is uh, it gives us that strength. It gives us that other set of eyes to see what we couldn't see and what others can't see. Speaking of your speech, Silash, would you do us the honor of reading it today? Oh, sure. Thank you. Yeah, it, uh, they are saying that the videos of the speech will be published uh, early January to coincide with Veganuary. So, yeah, sure, I'll read it for you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, It's my privilege to speak at a venue where 200 years ago, you began rebelling against false orthodoxy. Today, I want to rebel with you against false orthodoxy by speaking on bovine matters. I mean, of course, cows. Yes, there is a cow in the room and not everyone can see it. I hope that by the end of the debate, I will be opened. The orthodoxy, the herd opinion, if you like, is that animal agriculture has little to do with climate change. I believe that is very wrong. I believe that based on data. I'm an environmentalist by occupation, but a systems engineer by profession. Systems is what I do. I invented the protocol for transforming early analog internet connections to more robust digital connections while accelerating their speed tenfold. Still today, any data accessed on the internet likely pass through a device implementing this protocol. I plead that this house rebel once again by voting for the proposition, this house would go vegan. Veganism is defined as a philosophy and way of living that seeks to exclude as far as is possible and practicable all forms of exploitation of animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose. The proposition asks that this house go vegan, not be vegan, implying that this is a journey, not a destination. I highly recommend this journey on ethical health and environmental grounds. I will now focus on the environmental reasons to go vegan. It is undeniable that human civilization has adversely impacted life support systems on the planet. Scientists have identified nine planetary boundaries that we must stay within for the sustainability of life on Earth. At the moment, we have transgressed six of them, and any one of these transgressions could end life as we know it. The good news is that when we go vegan, we help resolve all six of them. That's the power we have as individuals to reverse our existential crisis. 
Animal agriculture is the leading cause of ecological destruction because it uses 37% of the ice-free land area of the planet just to graze animals, while bottom trawling an area of the ocean floor the size of South America every year for industrial fishing. Animal agriculture is the only major activity in which we destroy forests and replace them not with other trees or timber or paper, but with grass, which drastically reduces the diversity of life that the land can support. Animal agriculture is the primary reason why humans have reduced the number of trees on the planet by half, from 6 trillion to 3 trillion over the past 10,000 years. Restoring those 3 trillion trees can draw down enough carbon to completely reverse climate change. Animal agriculture is grossly inefficient because animals must eat 39 pounds of plants to produce one pound of human food on average, a burden which the world can no longer afford. By going vegan, we can give nearly 40% of the ice-free land area of the planet, as well as the entire ocean, back to nature. When we restore the native ecosystems on that land, we can grow most of the 3 trillion trees that we cut down over the past 10,000 years. This helps resolve all six planetary boundary transgressions. The least violated transgression is freshwater change. Rewilding the land that's currently used for grazing animals will restore the freshwater cycles of the planet. The next is land system change. Going vegan will allow us to return nearly 40% of the land area of the planet back to nature, resolving this planetary boundary transgression. The next worst transgression is climate change, which can be resolved when the excess carbon in the atmosphere is absorbed in the trees and soil that we can restore to the ecosystems of the planet. The next is chemical pollution, which should be safely stored away in regenerating forests when we go vegan. Eating animal foods currently delivers concentrated doses of this chemical pollution into our bodies through bioaccumulation. Therefore, going vegan addresses chemical pollution for both the earth and ourselves. The next worst transgression is nitrogen and phosphorus loading, mainly through our overuse of synthetic fertilizers for crops. Since over half the crop outputs are fed to farmed animals, going vegan will resolve this transgression as well. All of these transgressions impact wildlife, and biodiversity loss is the worst of the six planetary boundary transgressions. By restoring habitats for wild animals and allowing them to live freely in the ocean, we will resolve this transgression as well. If instead we let wild animals die, we die. It is that serious. There are two explanations for perhaps the gravest threat ever posed to civilization and all life on Earth the imminent danger of runaway climate change. One explanation, the one we hear about all the time from our leading climate spokespeople, is the burning of fossil fuels. It's certainly true that the burning of fossil fuels contributes greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere, thereby warming the planet. But the other explanation, what I call the cow in the room, is rarely addressed. The human folly of exploiting animals that is animal agriculture. When these two sources of greenhouse gases are compared in the media, fossil fuel burning is always emphasized and is almost always assigned the greater responsibility for warming the planet. But the opposite is true. When you factor in the potential carbon absorption of the forest land cleared for animal agriculture, you find with any honest accounting, as I published in a peer-reviewed paper, that animal agriculture is responsible for at least 87% of greenhouse gases on an annual basis. When I made that calculation, I did not include the respiration of farmed animals. I did not include the bottom crawling of the oceans by industrial fishing. I did not include the carbon release by pasture maintenance fires set annually on grazing lands around the world. I did not include the loss of phytoplankton populations and sea forests due to industrial fishing. I did not include those factors, mainly because they haven't been reliably assessed due to a futile attempt by the orthodoxy to hide the cow in the room. But it seems clear to me that if we could estimate these factors and include them in the calculation, we would find that animal agriculture is responsible for, wait for it, 
well over 100% of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. Now, that sounds unbelievable. How could it possibly be responsible for more than 100%? Because the evidence points to the possibility that the Earth will start cooling in a vegan world, even if we continue to conduct all our other activities as we do today. The cessation of animal agriculture will result in healthy oceans, healthy forests, and healthy soils. And if you want to reverse climate change, then we must adopt a strategy that can draw down greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Healthy oceans and sea forests can do that. Healthy soils and trees can do that. Solar panels and electric cars cannot. Now, I'm not a supporter of the fossil fuel industry. Far from it. It is my engineering assessment that we must wean ourselves off fossil fuels gradually. But we burn fossil fuels to heat and cool our homes, to transport ourselves, to manufacture goods, to ship goods. These are all social goods. What social good comes from animal agriculture? Nothing. Only obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, biodiversity destruction, soil depletion, falling of our waterways, antibiotic resistance, dangerous and dehumanizing work, animal cruelty, climate catastrophe, world hunger, and let's not forget pandemics. Indeed, there is nothing that will not improve when we end the cruelty and folly of exploiting animals. I have just given you the intellectual reasons to go vegan. But lasting change comes not from the head, but from the heart. In that regard, I have made a pinky promise to our granddaughter, Kimaya, that the world will go largely vegan by 2026, which is the year we will have killed almost all the wild animals if we don't change course. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm confident that true to your 200-year tradition of rebelling against false orthodoxy, this house will once again break away from the herd, see the cow in the room, and vote for the proposition to help our generation keep the sacred promise for all the children of the world. Thank you for your consideration from the bottom of my heart. Beautiful, Salash. That is such a huge amount of information and truth in such a concise speech. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah we have to get the facts out there and let people decide, you know, and, um, and we cannot keep hiding these facts anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to you know, go along with the 15% and the consensus. <laughs> what is the consensus, consensus on how much greenhouse gas emissions is emitted by animal agriculture? You know, things like that. The facts are out there. And we are not counting these things, you know, and you say, why aren't we not counting those things? We have a situation where, you know, the uh, politicians are controlling science. We have an intergovernmental panel on climate change. Why are the governments involved in writing reports on climate change? Unless it's politics and not science anymore. Right? And you cannot solve problems with politicized science. So uh, we have to be honest and we have to have the integrity to put down the facts and you know as we see them. And then and then ask, how do you solve this? And the answer is staring at us in the face. It's be kind to all life. It's not that complicated to understand. And uh, can we not routinely be kind to all life? Can we not create a civilization in which we are routinely kind to all life? And uh, if you say it cannot be done, I say, why not? Mm -hmm. who, hasn't tr who has tried it so far? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are we on the trajectory to be mostly vegan by 2026? Do you see that happening? Do you feel that, Salash? Do you feel the gathering of people coming to this truth? I feel it. You know, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm convinced. I've always been convinced that it's going to happen because, uh, 
as an, you know, as someone who's looking at feasibility. So I mean, is it feasible to be, to have a vegan world by 2026? Uh, yeah, why not? It's just do this instead of that, right? So all of us can do this instead of that. That can be done. Uh, so when something is feasible, uh, and you said, as an engineer, when I set out working on a project, I assume that it's done. And then I figure out how do I get there, right? So it's, uh, the, the how is a very engineering question, which I've, you know, I'm happy to tackle that, right? But uh, uh, whether it can be done or not, that's a more of a, a theoretical question. And that theoretical question, when you answer it as yes, it can be done, then implementing it. It's not that hard. It's getting our minds uh, uh, around the fact that, you know, we have a job to do for the next generation. They are looking at us saying, when will you deliver on what you set out to do? Uh, you know, the reason the students at the Oxford Union uh, voted for us, I mean, some of them came and told me later, is that our side gave them hope that there is a way out. And they said their side, the other side, was giving them fear. That don't step over there. It's going to be hard. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be inconvenient and things like that. So it's, uh, it's, you know, hope over fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like in The Course of Miracles, there's only love and fear. That's the opposite right. of love is fear. So you were giving them love. Right. Yeah. Giving them love. You were giving the possibilities to love all and to feed all and right. and to restore their planet, the these these future grandchildren of ours and the grandchildren of all species. So as you often say, Silesh, it's much beyond hope. I mean, they might still use that word, the students, but what you're giving mm -hmm. them is the ability to take creative action out, you know, from that felt sense shock, they can move into the compassion to know that they can take creative action into new pathways, because this hasn't worked, it's never worked. And mm -hmm. we are at an all time crisis on the planet. And we're losing life at an astronomical rate. And so you're saying to them, you can take action. You can take creative action and gather and gather and gather because it's in your hands. Right. Yeah, it, it is fascinating, you know, because I had lunch at Oxford um, Mansfield College the previous day on the 29th. And um, so the lunch menu I mean, basically starts off with salad, which is completely vegan. And then the lunch menu had two main vegan dishes and two um, non-vegan dishes so one with I think meat one with fish and we all sit at this long table and eat together and I noticed that everyone was eating the vegan dishes I mean hardly anyone I mean none of, at least none on my table were eating the meat and dairy meat and uh, fish dishes so the tide is turning okay clearly it's turning and the industry is getting desperate about repressing people and so that you know they can keep a hold of what they have. And this is why they're there in full force at COP28, pretending that um, meat is sustainable nutrition, you know, meat and dairy is sustainable nutrition and things like that, which people are laughing at it now, you know, when they say things like that. Uh, and you know, and what's happening to Wayne Shang. And you know, not only sentencing him to 90 days, but also uh, putting a gag order on him so that he cannot talk to his 15 closest friends for two years. Uh, these are the kinds of repressive tactics that they're trying to use to maintain this herd going in the wrong direction. Okay, That's what they want. They want the herd to keep going in the wrong, uh, in the direction that gives them you know, greater and greater profits, greater exploitation of the planet. And we are peeling off from that herd and we are going in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And when you go in the opposite direction, it's not through repression, it's love, right? So we are walking in the direction of love. 
And, uh, and everyone, you know, we have our own differences and we figure out uh, how to navigate through those differences. But it's no longer about repression, no longer about forcing people to come along this way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's we do it voluntarily. I was listening to an amazing podcast yesterday by Dr. Gabor Mate, who I think I'm mm -hmm. going to reach out and talk to him about being vegan. <laughs> right. Love him. Um, and it's just getting back to our authenticity, but he was talking about, you know, three really important days when we're looking at this type of issue is, is authenticity versus attachment and humans mm -hmm. are, are the most vulnerable species that comes here and needs care for a long time. So we will in the adapting stage of wanting to not lose our attachment to the people around us, we will forfeit our authenticity. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I really put that into play into the vegan world and in, in my spirit and my mind for the next couple of days, you know, today and yesterday, while I, I thought about this, I thought about as our entire tribes go vegan, they're not going to have to worry about losing their attachment with their family, with their culture, with their, they can be actually completely authentic with right. themselves. And I believe right. all children have the ability to really understand authenticity. You know, my, my family, I went to visit my daughter, she just arrived from the States. And, you know, she's a veterinarian specialist, and hopefully she won't watch this podcast. <laughs> she doesn't anyways. Mm. But she, you know, they were having chicken wings, I brought salad and soup, and they were having chicken wings. And I don't think my four year old granddaughter has ever um, been offered that before. And she said, and she's quite matter of fact, little girl. And they asked her, she wanted chicken wings. She says, a wing of a chicken? No, thanks. <laughs> and it's, mm -hmm. it's like, what the heck? What happened right. in that process? You know, like a wing of a bird. Right. I'm going to chomp on that to the bone. Right. So Somewhere along the way, we learned to attach and adapt into a place that was not love. It was fear of losing our connection. And now right. we're coming home. Now we're coming home to our authenticity, all of us. So Absolutely. thank you, my love. Thank you for being so yeah. authentic and helping so many of us um, have the strength to do our creative action. You're such a force to be reckoned with. Any no, thank final, you. final words for us, Silas? Well, keep the faith. You know, this is this is happening. This is happening. I feel it in, in my bones. And we are uh, gathering and moving in the right direction, which is the opposite of the way we were moving. And uh, so the Vegan Forest Festival is happening next February 16th through 18th. And there again, you know, it's about fashioning the new system. What does it look like? Yeah, And there is a creative example right there in Southern Forest that we can start with. Where again, it's all volunteers yeah, who are doing this, who are restoring the forests of the world. And who are caring for each other there in a love-based exactly. community. So they go, yeah. they're, they're fed, they, they do um, different uh, services, uh, you know, there it's a sat, it's um, it's a siva community where uh, selfless service, mm -hmm. and and that's what so many of us are here doing. We're here just doing our little part. And as our granddaughter Julie Julia uh, Julie Barnes says, we don't always know what we're supposed to do, but we show up and we just do something. She says you have to just do something. And it's in that okay. doing of something that allows us to feel less powerless over, over what's going on. Because the, the time of the ranting and being overwhelmed is over. We right. are given, I believe, all the energetic and spiritual tools to go forward. I was thinking yesterday, I had a 14-hour day yesterday, mostly on my feet. And, and you know, at 60, I feel... <laughs> I just, I'm like, oh, I'm okay. I just need to take a little bit of a break, soak my feet in hot water. And I got one more hour of stuff done that I needed to get done. <laughs> and it's like that, right, Silas? Right, what absolutely, 60? yeah. Right. 60 isn't, what's 60, you know? Right. 
yeah, yeah. tremendous energy you know i'm 63 64 yeah <laughs> And speaking of which, the climate healers and the grandmothers have a convergence every three months. The next one's going to be January 27th and 28th. And it's on Healthy Me, Healthy Planet, making that beautiful connection. We'll have some of the, I hope some of the uh, speakers that have were at the debate for, for that and really making that connection between what, what goes on in us, our ability to connect, our ability to be healthy, our ability to make the next right move depends on how we're connecting with the planet and whether we're praising her or poisoning her. So please join us for that. You'll find the link on climatehealers.org. Thank you again, Salash. My pleasure.